homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is the podcast where we bring you the freshest, most zesty ingredients for you to brew your own faith. Today, you're going to get a little audiological taste of what radical theology sounds like when it shows up and runs a church. Today on the podcast, Christopher Rodkey is here. He's going to talk about uh, his books. He's been working on a series that, that takes radical theology and preaches through the Christian liturgical cycle. Uh, he also has a new book called Synaptic Gospel. We're going to talk about that. And uh, so it's going to go from like, uh, you know, his own story of how you end up taking death of God theology and being ordained into a church to like church meetings and preaching and worship and at the end, there's some crazy, practical, super awesome things. So just buckle your safety belt and get ready. But before we jump in, head on over to homebrewedchristianity.com where you can click through and get Christopher Rodkey's text at amazon.com and we get a little share back. Um, you can also go over there, click the little tweet, the Facebook button, tell your friends about this episode, um, and you can connect with us in a whole host of ways. Um, one of them is the Homebrewed Christianity Community. That is our like monthly patrons of the podcast who also make up our kind of ongoing learning community and we just finished week one of varieties of postmodern theology and that class is one you can join uh, as being a member uh, of the community it was a ton of fun and then this week we're going to do another variety of postmodern theology we're going to be talking about david ray griffin constructive postmodernism also do know that if you are a disciple of christ and about to head to your general assembly I'm headed there as well. We got two nights of podcasting in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but let's say you're not going to be there and you're like, why am I getting left out trip here? Let me help you out. I have some imagination sauce. That's right. As part of my new job at the Hatchery LA as the director of theology and the humanities, I have put together a live sampling of Hatchery style learning with some of the best thinkers in our world. So uh, if you want to head on over, to the podcast page, you can be able to click through and you can sign up to to uh, to, to join um, six different twenty to thirty minute little uh, conversations with the likes of Harvey Cox talking about how to read the Bible, Shane Blackshear talking about podcasting as a ministry tool, Grace Jason Kim embracing the other, John Caputo's new book Confessions of a Postmodern Pilgrim, Adam Clark we're going to talk about theology from Mother Emanuel and Christopher Rodkey who you're about to hear will be on there again talking to ministers um, about his book The Synaptic Gospel. Anyway, so just head on over to homebrewedchristianity.com you can click through the link and uh, sign up for any of the live video streaming interactive imagination sauce sessions yes so thank you for listening here comes the interview and i hope that you're having an excellent summer and uh you know until next time share the brew hello homebrewed christianity listeners this is trip and today on the other line is that one and only Preacher of the theology that is most radical, <laughs> most radical, radical. I can't talk. Christopher Rodkey, what's up? How you doing, Trip? Thanks for having me on today. Oh well, I am very excited about it because <clears throat> there are rumors that radical theologians do actually attend church and on occasion preach. And I, when you know, I, if you just type your name into the internet, I see you in a stole. That's right. That's right. I am an ordained United Church of Christ pastor. And I pastor a medium-sized United Church of Christ congregation, St. Paul's, in Dallastown, Pennsylvania, which is immediately in the center between Harrisburg and Baltimore in the Pennsylvania region of Pennsylvania. Yeah, and um, for people that, uh, that don't know you, um, not only are you an ordained minister, you have your uh, PhD, you're an author, um, you, you've recently published a book going through the lectionary, um, Too Good to Be True. Uh, radical Christian preaching for year A, which means something to a few people, um, and <laughs> and also the synaptic gospel. Um, so so maybe you could b begin by telling us how in the world an academic radical theologian who's also ordained makes sense with almost anything. That seems like you are an endangered species if there is one. Um, so so how do you wear all those hats at the same time? Well, let me tell you how I discovered radical theology. I was an undergraduate student at St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which is a very small Benedictine uh, college. And it's a 
school that has a pretty good philosophy department because it serves a Catholic seminary there. Uh, so they have a lot of students in their, that uh, are doing their philosophy studies before they're allowed to do seminary. And uh, so I essentially went through a lot of the academic preparation that a a Catholic priest would do the serious heavy lifting of philosophy uh, before entering seminary. And uh, and I had a really deep introduction into continental philosophy. And I was writing um, a paper for a religious studies course uh, on Christology. Uh, And I wanted to do a paper on Nietzsche and, and Christ. Um, And, that in fact, that paper in college kind of changed the course of my career. Uh, but while I was researching it, at like at any good Benedictine college, the the library is at the center of campus, and uh, at the time that library uh, was not exactly up to fire code in the way that buildings are now, and it goes several layers underground. And I used to love to hide in those underground layers before cell phones, so no no one could find me, and it was a good place to work. And one time I think I fell asleep or something and I got locked into the library overnight. So I, so I woke up and I thought, well, you know, I might as well just keep working. And there it's <laughs> when I, there is when I found while trying to write a paper on Nietzsche's understanding of Christ, uh, this death of God theology and, and Altizer. And it made absolutely no sense to me, but it made a lot of sense in, in terms of looking at Nietzsche's pretty serious critiques of Christianity, that there was something still to hold on to that was very authentically Christian. Mm-hmm. And and understanding and seeing writers like Tillich, when I was just started reading Tillich, um, one of the first books I read of his, and I, a book I read once a year, is called The Irrelevance and Relevance of the Christian Message, uh, which is a series of lectures he did at Pacific School of Religion years ago, um, where he, he calls Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud the greatest Christian writers of our era. And, uh, and of course I think he's being kind of joking. He's joking about that, but there is something very serious about that. And that those are the questions that kind of led me into seminary and, and really started to let me picture myself as being a person of faith, but also taking this intellectual trajectory really seriously. Um, but I very quickly learned, uh, as a candidate for ordination of the United Methodist church that, um, this stuff made people very nervous. Uh, and I did not realize just how nervous it made people and how, what ab- abjection there was, uh, to this line of thinking, uh, in, in the church, partic- particularly the Methodist church I grew up in. Um, and, and even seminaries, when I started looking around at seminaries and saying, Hey, I'm really interested in death of God theology. They'd be like, what's th-? I'd either get what's that, or why would you want to do that? Or maybe this isn't the place for you. Um, so I, so I ended up at the university of Chicago divinity school where I continued to, um, continue to read on Altizer. But again, uh, the university of Chicago is not a place that takes radical theology real seriously. Um, in fact, not too many seminaries or divinity schools do. Um, but I did have access to lots of stuff in the library there. And, uh, and I worked with David Tracy there and Catherine Tanner and, and all the good faculty there and ended up at Drew uh, where I worked with Robert Corrington um, and Chris Bozel and Catherine Keller. And really, my dissertation ended up being on Tillich's influence on Altizer and Mary Daly. And then I tried to bring Mary Daly and Altizer, who seemed to be diametrically opposing figures on, on a lot of things, into conversation and, and trying to show that some of the very opposite or ne- uh, opposing language they use is often for the same things. Um, or they're making similar moves. Um, and I think the difference here is that Mary Daly is much more like t- more Talikian in that she's willing to open the door into post Christianity and walk through it. Uh, whereas Altizer is willing to step out of that door a little bit, but then gets sucked back in and is very much changed by that experience. Mm-hmm. If that makes some sense. So, um, so, uh, going through, um, uh, the ordination process in the United Church of Christ, um, I've, I found myself kind of a lone voice. But working in churches, I'm finding that people are really interested in this trajectory. The, the, the older folks that are in a lot of these mainline churches remember the death of God controversy from the 60s, or they, they remember something about it. Um, and they're, they're kind of interested in it, and they, they kind of get it. When I talk about Altizer's perspective of death of God theology, they – they get that this isn't a rejection 
of God per se, but it is uh, radically rethinking what God is mm-hmm. uh, in a way that takes the Holocaust seriously, in a way that takes deconstruction, postmodernism seriously, but it's still very much Christian and Christ-centered that comes with a very liberal theology on one hand, for lack of a better word, and a very high Christology. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in the United Church of Christ, and I think in a lot of other mainline churches, it makes sense that you have a liberal theology or a liberal political theology and a very low Christology. Oh, yeah. But here we have a, a – I don't think you can get a higher Christology than Altizer's um, and with, with, with a very radical political and, and theological outlook. And that, that has um, really changed my outlook and is, is really essential in my preaching. And uh, as I've been preaching the lectionary and working with people in churches, I, I find this a really helpful way of thinking about theology. Um, and I've started to bring in other theologians into my, into my toolbox, Gerard in particular, um, it, as a way of interpreting the Bible in a way that makes sense on Sunday mornings to uh, to people that are often uh, very entrenched in the old ways uh, and uh, looking looking to looking to deeper their understanding of of the Bible, but also really wrestling with the relevance of Christianity in these churches that are that are dying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hope that makes sense of how. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but you I'm know, at. you're a minister. You teach these things in the pulpit and in the classroom, and and right now you've already mentioned four or five different schools' names. that are probably their listeners are like, I don't know what this is. I have to find out. Okay. And normally, when you ask, um, I'm not. We shouldn't name names, but we have some mutual friends. If you ask them to briefly explain or introduce a thinker or a school of thought or concept, um, thinking general, intelligent reader, listener, but who just doesn't have multiple graduate degrees, uh, they fail miserably. So, mm-hmm. um, it, But you actually talk to real human beings on a regular basis and have to preach to them. So I, I want to play a little game where, right. where, where you know, when, when someone comes to ask a minister about a big idea or a thinker, they're really wanting something to hang their hat on so they have a reference point when they think about it in the future or hear you talk about it again and that kind of thing. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see what comes out. I, right. I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm shaking your hand, leaving the church and I'm like, Oh, Reverend Rodkey, that was just, that was just a great sermon. I just, what's a, so what's a radical theology? What is radical theology? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a lot of different ways that radical theology is, um, various schools of th- radical theology, but uh, the one that I find most compelling is the one that's most associated with the death of God theology uh, and most specifically with to Altizer, Thomas Altizer's work. So Thomas Altizer's work is, um, it's amazingly systematic in the way that is unfolded over the several decades. The main motif of it is kenosis, mm-hmm. which is from Philippians, uh, for re- listeners that aren't familiar, it's it's the outpouring of God into flesh, the self-negation, self sub- self um, self suicidal act of incarnation, and the the vision of God the Father becoming God the Son is uh, as an incarnation is an absolute incarnation. It's not a partial incarnation. It's not a uh, a personhood concept it is an actual uh outflowing or outpouring of god the father into god the son so that that which is and this follows along the language of philippians that which was kingly is now a slave that which is transcendent is now in space and time that which is pure spirit is now enfleshed and um that becomes the metaphor for the entire system it's Altizer's thought is Trinitarian in what I might call a diachronal Trinitarianism instead of a perpetual Trinitarian Mm -hmm. uh, thought, which is that the Trinity indicates the the three primary moments of kenosis or presence of God as we may know through kenosis, namely that um, before before Genesis 1, there is this absolute God because that's all that is. And the moment of creation 
uh, creates this subjectivity or this creation of God as this being separate from something else. Uh, and interestingly, interestingly, there's a lot of connections with Jewish uh, Kabbalah in, in in this way of thinking that um, that this begins the process of God outpouring God's self into the world. And the story of the Hebrew Bible very much is this story of God uh, outflowing into the world. And then the remnant of what is left of transcendence is what becomes incarnated into Christ. And there's this forward and downward movement of history that's always occurring in God in Altizer's thought. Um, that going forward and downward into human flesh um, and eventually – through Jesus into hell itself. Whereas in hell, the only place to go forward and downward is to come back uh, into, into this space and time uh, to show that now we can, we can live Christ lives and we can uh, take up the cross of Christ ourselves. Um, Altizer's thought kind of ends with the, with the, um, with the uh, resurrection of Jesus um, I like to play it a little further that the the ascension is symbolic of this forward and downward movement, that there's nowhere left to go downward uh, so that in Jesus's ascension uh, where he's carried up into the heavens, uh, the outpouring of spirit on Pentecost is this final outward uh, forward and downward movement into all ha- all uh, hands and faces so that now in this eight, this third epoch in the Trinity of the age of the Holy Spirit, we are uh, we can understand God as part of this assembled community, uh, as as part of a larger, larger body. Uh, but it is now on us to no longer look to the sky for for answers to our problems, but to to look look to ourselves to to find out how we can work toward the kingdom of God by being the kingdom of God itself. Um, is that making some sense so far? Yeah, but I I, I want. So are you? It sounds like uh, so you're saying that they're, they're, God used to be up in heaven and then there anymore. That's right, that's right. Man, that, uh, uh, but that is not to say that I would not find the language of transcendence to be unhelpful uh, in terms of understanding the divine. But when I think about the divine in the present moment, it is this assembled community in the in the here and now um, where two or three or more are gathered uh, that, that this is, this is how we make God know now is, is not locking ourselves into a closet and praying for Supreme court decisions to go certain ways. It's, it's about working for justice <coughs> and living out the justice of, of, of God now uh, being self-sacrificial uh, to the oppressed and exploited in the here and now. So how does uh, or you or Altizer, um, uh, what, the death of God, you mean the death of the Father, right? Is that mm, – and that's um, like how do you take that back into most of the – or would you push back against most of the doct- – like most other understandings of the Trinity where the father-son relation is a not simply economic? And the, like, right, like if you – there's the imminent Trinity, which is God as God is in God's self for all eternity prior to the decision to create – and then there's the economic trinity, which you know has a story. If people in church history have done epics, it's epics, but they're economic epics. It's not epics in the sense of uh, there's like this the epoch of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and now the others aren't there. Um, mm-hmm. So, so it, what's the point of arguing in this being um, like what's being gained by by parting ways with? Uh, the discussion around the Trinity for so long. Well, I find it helpful in preaching to really look to the language of the later prophets, mm-hmm. uh, p- specifically around idolatry. And this is where I find the work of Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Vahanian really helpful uh-huh. uh, because it's all about idolatry. Um, that if we can understand looking back at Christian history, and preaching the Christian gospel to people in the here and now, right now, that are very skeptical and have a hard time associating themselves with something that has been so awful in history, that the ways in which 
Christianity goes wrong is often when we start worshiping this uh, ghost of the Sado sublime, you know, as Mary Daly would call it, uh, this this nothingness uh, that is or shadow of this God that once was but is no longer. And the more and more that this this false God is worshipped, the more and more evil it can do. And the more and more we cast ourselves into it, the easier it is to cast ourselves and the images of ourselves into it. So that if we can, if we read the Christian gospels in a way that understands that this, I have a hard time walking away from the Christian gospels and um, saying that this is really about God, the father. There's very little about God, the father in, in the Christian gospels. It is about God, the son, but more importantly, it's about this, this vision of the kingdom of God that's coming, right? And it's not necessarily this, this kingdom of God that comes in the next life, but is this kingdom of God that is, that we are, the disciples are about to see. Um, but, but, uh, it's not going to be kind of paradise. So I, f- I find this, this motion of God in history really helpful for understanding and making sense of the scriptures. What, what do we gain out of it is that I think it, it provides us a new language for being critical and honest about Christian history uh, in a way that does not skirt the tough issues mm-hmm. and in a way that helps us look at the violence of the Old Testament, for example, and, and really read it quite honestly and in a helpful way. Um, and this, and that's where I find someone like Gerard's work really helpful. Um, that, uh, in, in the story of Abraham and Isaac, for example, uh, the name of God in Hebrew changes, right? The God that tells him to go sacrifice the sun in, in the Mount, the Moriah mountain range, which was probably at the site of the eye of Moloch where the firstborn child was born or would be killed. Um, that the God that tells Abraham to do that, uh, is, is named one thing, and then the 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 highest name God sends an angel to interrupt it, uh, indicating that there's a there's a different kind of God that's being understood here. Old understandings of God have have gone away. New understandings of God are now that God is this perpetually changing thing in history that is always changing, uh, perhaps dialectically uh, in the here and now. That that to use the UCC's metaphor that God really is still speaking and it's speaking through the church. And yep. there is this continuing Testament that's going on in the church right now for all Does the change. Though, the change, would you say the change is located, um, uh, within God, within our under our reception of God, like is our concept of God changing and becoming more clear to the point that we realize they're not, there isn't a father or is, God becoming more clear about what it means to be God until God commits fatris, <laughs> like uh, suicide. Um, like, w- where's the change taking place? Our understanding of the concept, or is God and God's own self changing? I think God and God's own self is changing, but it's and it's not something that we are necessarily empowered to change. Uh, it's up to us to kind of go along with it when we so choose. So, um, if I act in a way that prevents justice or prevents or, or allows or perpetuates violence. I may say that, that that is an act of killing God because it's refusing to allow God to uh, move in history. Right. But I can also speak of the death of God in a positive way that if I am, if I really am carrying out uh, the cross and am being self-sacrificing, then I am carrying out a death of God. So the death of God for me is this, has this double edge to it that um, it we can speak of the death of God as the apprehension or the holding back of God in history or the death of God as something where we, <coughs> as the church uh, and individuals within the church um, move, uh, move in a self-sacrificing way um, that, that creates new avenues of justice. It's kind of like in, in Hegel's thought where Geist kind of bubbles up in certain moments or, or until it's thought of the, the, um, the, um, uh, theonomy that, um, that, uh, when, when we do little acts of justice or big acts of justice, that's God breaking in mm-hmm. to the system, but it only happens through us. Would um, you, uh, locate that then? Um, cause you've used the phrase like, well, in the church, in the life of the church, but you wouldn't say that that's, uh, the only place it happens. 
it's not the only place it happens, but I think that uh, I don't think you can have, and I say this as somebody in the church, I don't think that you can really have a full understanding of it aside from being part of an assembled community of some sort. Mm-hmm. Though, though I wouldn't limit it to the walls of the church. Yeah, but so, but say more about that. That that is a that's not very postmodern of you. No, I guess I'm kind of traditional about that. Um, that uh, well, if 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 Pentecost means that spirit has has now been poured out onto all flesh, uh, that's just not some flesh. It's all flesh. So, um, like the ones playing football that you watch on Sunday like morning, the ones playing football, yeah. or the ones. Or the ones you see doing horrendous acts, you know, on television on the, on the other side of the world. Um, God is poured out onto all flesh, and that is there's something tremendously empowering about that. But the but the the reality of the human condition is is that this this is this is the most dangerous thing that God has ever done uh, is to empower us in that way. So to the question about the church. Um, the, the church becomes the institution, and we can broadly define what a church is. The church becomes the institution that that trains us to do this. But so often the church has been something that has done the opposite, which is retreating back to the status quo or or uh, lusting after death in some way or, or moving us backwards rather than forward. Mm-hmm. So the church isn't – the church as an institution isn't necessary. In fact, the church – as a concept may need to go away for the church to actually happen. Right. Yeah. So, but you work in a real one, mm-hmm. like a real Dale church with walls I work in a visible church and it has, it has uh, boards and committees. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, what goes through your, uh, how does a radical theology lens? Why would you kill God and not kill board meetings? Let's put it that way. Well, um, uh, <laughs> you know, committees are the places where good ideas go to die. You may have heard, and uh, yeah, but the especially cross is where tr- God goes to die. So I'm just saying, right. the well, that's true. So there is a similar site here, um, but it's. I think that we're going to be moving into the future into a the church as a human institution, looking quite different than it does now. Mm-hmm. the 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 good thing about the committee structures that. <laughs> on our mainline churches so much is that by having those committee structures, it usually puts a check and balance system from the pastor becoming too powerful uh, and leading a church in a, in a bad direction. Uh, but on the other hand, very often it's those committees that are holding the pastor from genuinely leading the, the church forward. Um, and it, the longer I work in churches, it's, it's more clear to me just how hard it is to, to move structures that have been in place for decades and centuries, Mm -hmm. uh, even in kind of younger churches. So I don't know if I have an answer of what the committee structure looks like for a radical Christian church, but I think the, and and this is where I have a lot of affinity with the, with the uh, emergent movement or, or what was the emergent movement. The, is this refocus on the mission of the church and reclaiming the church in this neighborhood, for example, in my congregation, uh, we're an open and affirming congregation. I think that, um, and this is a conversation we're having right now, I think that claiming who our mission field really is and looking at the neighborhood that we're, we are located in as the mission field is a completely neglected area of, of the congregation, um, is really looking at the needs and the needs and what, um, what needs, I guess needs is the right word, what the needs are of the immediate surrounding of the congregation and meeting those needs, not with the hope of hoping they show up to church and start putting money in the plate, but this is our mission. This is, this is where this, this church becomes the site of our self-sacrificing act. Um, and secondly, as, as the progressive voice, progressive Christian voice in our region, uh, that's that's not afraid to kind of tiptoe around the tough issues of theology or sexuality. Um, so, really, in being really intentional about engaging these things in serious ways. Um, but right now, in my current congregation that I've been in for not quite three years, um, the the focus is going to move now um, on the immediate neighborhood and understanding this, understanding our mission, not in terms of. We need we need to get more members, 
but this is what we need to do to live out our mission and our and our call to be Christ for for this community. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense, or is no, that no, sound no, too, it, too old fashioned? I it it sounds uh, deliciously old fashioned, um, but. Uh, I mean, and it, and it also makes sense because I think like one of the emphases you see in Altizer's work is kind of the emphasis on the apocalyptic shape of Christianity mm-hmm. and um, this kind of impending demand and call on the present. And then the, the spirit and its life in the community is kind of a turn towards the material existence of what's actually there and the relationships among the people that are there and um Oftentimes, it's really hard for churches to actually take the relationship of the people that are within the church and that church's relationship to the community with ultimate seriousness. And radical theology is just like, well, no, that's kind of like – that's like the centerpiece. It's not – the idea is about some God that's external to here. Um, what God takes ultimately seriously is the very things you're probably ignoring and would rather debate about topics about other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think – and this might seem seem like splicing hairs a little bit, but where I love the the language that emergent Christianity has used about incarnational community and relational uh, relational community. Um, but I I think I want to take it a step further that uh, of a canonic community mm-hmm. that really that isn't just about having intimate relationships because that's that's good and that's important too if we're going to move forward. But but really being the the site of of self-sacrifice on on this block on this street you know that this parking lot will be the place where we sacrifice ourselves for this community in mm-hmm. some way and and not expect something in return for it that's that's the shift that i'm ecclesiologically working through yeah so so uh when other progressive christians are freaking out you've said sacrifice a whole bunch of times mm-hmm. now i'm getting awkward my my uh my my inner feminist critique of the misappropriation of kenosis is running in there and i'm like christopher come on maybe maybe you should think this through again so what's your kind of response to people that are like yes yeah, sacrifice that's that's really good for you know upper middle class white affluent straight men but why are you gonna why are you imposing this on everyone what if what if other people need to be uh lifted up and not told to sacrifice even more well, I think that that's that's a great question, and uh, I think that's that's really the from an academic perspective the the big challenge to this way of thinking, and 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 this answer might might seem a little bit like a cop out, but I I think that keeping those concerns real and in the conversation uh, is a way of of making sure that the sacrifice to you doesn't get misappropriated, right? appropriating it in a in a just way making sure the con- conversations about women's bodies uh and and the ways in which kenosis has been used uh to 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 justify rape and justify all kinds of exploitation making sure that that is part of the conversation uh on a regular basis um and and part of the understanding of the ministry on a regular basis um i found that talking about domestic violence from the pulpit makes people really uncomfortable. I can talk about the riots in Ferguson uh, and get a few people a little angry, but talking about domestic violence, it's, it's um, that, that takes on, that's a, that pushes people, people's comfort zones a little bit too much um, mm-hmm. because it requires a lot more intellectual um, seriousness, into, uh, intellectual seriousness to, to really make sense of it. So it might not be the, the good answer. Uh, and I'm sure uh, many of my feminist sisters and brothers would disagree with me here. But I, but I think that, I think that these ideas are compatible. Um, if, if we are cognizant and take the conversation seriously. And, and again, that's, that's part of my draw to, to taking Mary Daly really seriously too. Um, and I know that Mary Daly has all kinds of problems in her own system of thought. Um, uh, specifically with uh, transsexualism, um, but the uh, but the move, keeping the conversation there and, and continuing it is what I think is really important. Mm-hmm. Does that so, make sense? Or no, no, it does. And uh, what, one of the things that I'm interested in is how you think through what's about to happen each week in worship. 
So, mm. I mean, I mean, you have a whole Texas working through the lectionary, but you're also working with uh, uh, other staff, volunteers, artists, uh, liturgical resources. Um, it, some Sundays you're going to be doing sacraments, baptisms, all that kind of stuff. Um, how does your own theological framework uh, uh, set you up? What kind of questions are you taking into worship prep, um, um, the flow of the service, all that kind of stuff? Well, so the congregation I work in is very much entrenched in the German Reformed tradition uh, or the ENR tradition of the United Church of Christ. So there are a lot of parameters of liturgical style here. It's it's pretty old school. Um, so I try to pour, pour things into that uh, wineskin uh, that, that make it new. Um, so – Quite honestly, we use the Heidelberg Catechism sometimes in worship uh, as as part of our call and response, as as uh, re- being restored as the community after our corporate act of uh, reconciliation. Um, this is something I talk about in the Synaptic Gospel, which is my first book, um, that is about training people to think liturgically. So, offering a, a smorgasbord of ideas in gentle or subversive ways. In the into the worship service that might seem very simple, but after being practiced for a long time, become part of the fabric of understanding of people. And for a good, good example of this, and this is something I talk about in, in the book, um, the one of the best things that I think I do in, in terms of worship is the children's sermon. Mm-hmm. You know, churches love to have the children's sermon because they love to be reminded that there are still kids here um, and that uh, – but what may, has always made me uncomfortable when I first started working in churches <laughs> is, is just how much those children are being used as, as uh, you know, you do object lessons, but the children become object lessons for the congregation, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's wrong to do to children. So, um, and I think there can be really good ways of doing children's moments in churches. But for me, um, I've reclaimed the tradition of having baptismal reaff- reaffirmation every Sunday, that the children come to the font and they put their hands in the font and we, we do a blessing of some sort every single week so that those kids, um, when we have a baptism, whether it's a child or an adult uh, being baptized, I invite the children to come forward and, and they lead, they help lead us through the blessing of the waters and they lay their hands on the one that's about to be baptized. And for the person, people being baptized in this way, I think it's um, it's it's meaningful that the children of the congregation are the ones doing the blessing, and you know from a polity point of view, this this emphasizes at least in the UCC tradition that I, as the pastor, am not the one with the magic powers mm-hmm. doing. This. It's the community that's doing this, and not just the community, but we we have the children going up and actually performing the baptism on some level. Um, we do the same thing with corporate acts of reconciliation that the children uh, kind of started out and, and then they become the witnesses to the adults performing acts of reconciliation. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that I, I like to do in worship services, and that's a good example. And once in a while, someone says they get a little uncomfortable with the way that the children splash around in the font um, and, and it's disrespectful or irreverent. Um, but, but for me that this makes it reverent and this is about teaching children that this is their, this is their site of theological, this, their theological playground in this church. And, uh, when we say that, that we, that we love you and that you're part of us through our baptism, we really mean it. Um, and, and the children become the challenge to us to live up to those standards, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing is uh, I'm really interested in confirmation. Uh, one of my projects coming down the road is going to be writing a book on the theology of confirmation and the, the history of confirmation in the Christian church is really interesting uh, of how it developed. But um, right now I'm leading a, uh, an adult confirmation class of I think nine, nine adults. It's the first time I've done it in this church. And for me, it's important that adults go through confirmation classes and reaffirm their their statement of why they are here on some level uh, to show the children and teenagers that they're willing to do this too. You know, that confirmation is not this rite of passage that we make it as painful as possible uh, before, before you have the ritual that is your excuse to not come back. Uh, That this, (laughs) that this, um, that we renew our commitment to continue to learn and continue to make this 
uh, commitment that uh, I don't get confirmed and then I don't have to learn anything anymore. Uh, and, and demonstrating that to the children in a way that the children become involved in the, in the process for, for the adult confirmands in the same way that we might have adults uh, be mentors for the, for the teenagers to it. Mm-hmm. Does that make some sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I understand. I mean, I've worked at a couple different disciples in UCC churches, and one of the tendencies that's been in place, and when I try to do work against it, people get uncomfortable, is this weird dichotomy between being worshiping beings and being uh, sponges for education. There's a tendency to want the children basically to learn until they get confirmed, and then you can go to worship. And everyone that's in worship basically just needs to go to worship. And education and spiritual formation is a hobby you do after you retire, maybe. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, as opposed to recognizing, <clears throat> like you could be, you could rarely worship as a kid at church because they're, and that just blows my mind. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the things I really liked uh, about your book was the emphasis that, like, no, no, in the community, when you're worshiping, you're doing education. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. idea that, Children would learn about God, faith, Christian mission, all those things in a classroom outside of the body of the church is problematic. But Mm -hmm. what is it like going into a situation, especially one that has got the uh, evangelical Reformed Church kind of vibe to it, um, uh, and and taking these things like confession, um, the reading of Scripture— uh, the sermon and these types of things and making them a place for more than uh, people that have abstract thinking and enjoy listening to monologues. Sure. So um, just as some examples, uh, about every two months I do a children's service, which is not um, – and it's what I refer to in my book as pan-generational worship uh, where – um, and this this isn't radical or my own thinking. I can kind of set up stations in the sanctuary um, and make this sanctuary a place where we uh, tell stories and I involve the adults in the story. So mm-hmm. um, one of the best things I ones I did was the blessing of the dinosaurs. So I had I told the kids for weeks coming up to it. I know, you know, some dinosaurs that have never been to church. So I want you to bring bring your dinosaurs to church this Sunday and um, and we talked about monsters in the Bible and that sort of thing, um, where I had children bring in uh, – I told them to bring in the strangest stuffed animal animals they have uh, that are actual animals. And I picked out some adults from the church to play Adam, you know, and had the children presenting their animals to Adam, you know, as part <laughs> of the Genesis story. And had the, had the adults, the adult men say, you know, I really don't want to marry the mosquito. You know, I'm I'm really not into the giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, to, to to kind of bring the humor out in that story. The porcupine, um, so, it just seems awkward. I don't know. Yeah, it's, that's not my thing. Um, so I try to do that on a regular basis. But again, um, and, and part of that service then, too, is making clear that when we do um, – when we do the blessings of the, of the church in some way, whether it's, it's uh, our pastoral prayer or whether it's the blessing over the offering or the final benediction, the children are, are involved in it in a way that doesn't put them on the spot as performers, but they're active participants with me in the congregation doing it. Mm-hmm. That makes some sense. So, and, and um, for me in terms of preaching and that's what my, my other writing is about is is preaching the death of god of really giving a completely different aspect to scripture than i think people are used to getting um and it might not always be something that is completely divorced from mainline protestant theology um but but really kind of breaking down um scripture in a way that hopefully makes sense and what i'm doing right now is uh i'm off the lectionary i'm doing uh mark the gospel of Mark chapter by chapter every week. And when I first said this, someone said, you mean we got to have, you know, three months of just Mark. And I said, well, if we follow the lectionary, we'd spend almost all year on it. So this is a lot shorter. So the, (laughs) the, uh, what I'm trying to do is, is, uh, and uh, is teach, teach my congregation how to read the Bible and not just be passive, passive participants in ideological dissemination from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Um, but but rather inviting them along to understand how we come to this 
hermeneutical place where we start to interpret this uh, and and start to proclaim this as the word in this community. So, um, and I got the idea of it when I was on paternity leave last late last summer, and uh, while uh, while our friend Andrea Stevenson was filling in for me, uh, sh- uh, and I was watching everybody go into the church next door because I live in the parsonage. I was watching Charles Stanley, uh, you know, on TV, and uh, you know, <laughs> I don't his theology is and his ideology is not my thing. But what he does, he sits down and opens the Bible, and he gives a pretty serious Bible study, and then he gives a little homily at the end, and it's good. Um, and it, it captivates the attention of his audience. So, you know, that's that's what I'm doing right now is is I have my – the first time I did, I said, let's open our Bibles up to Mark 1. And I said, did you hear that sound? That's the sound of Bibles cracking as we open them, right? So <laughs> we, we're kind of reclaiming this idea of bringing your Bible to church, which is something I grew up with. Um, and really looking at the scripture and and talking about some of the Greek Greek terminology that sometimes gets lost and um, and the other thing is uh, since I've been to Israel and I took a lot of pictures I've been able to use a lot of that visually in, in the service and um, so yesterday today's Monday yesterday Sunday was um, Mark eleven and it was the story of the temple uh, the cleansing of the temple and the fig tree uh, which is it's interesting that the fig tree story is, is put in two parts with the temple in the middle. So that, so I try to teach instead of breaking these pericopes up as the lectionary does showing how the sequence of events kind of matters uh, in the storytelling, particularly in the gospel of Mark um, that the, the curse of the fig tree has something to do with what Jesus is saying about the temple. So that the focus is not on the people that were change, exchanging money outside the temple and selling pure, pure animals to sacrifice but rather, it was really more about the whole system of purity itself. Yeah. Um, and and then you know Peter says afterwards, you know, kind of is focusing on the outcome of the tree, and Jesus says, you know, that's not what this is about, you know, and and he says something about the, you know, we need to, you have to have faith uh, in such a way that can move this mountain and throw it into the sea. Well, what what I take from that is having been to Jerusalem now, uh, they're talking about the Temple Mount. You know, we need to be able to take this this entire holy city, this entire temple, and throw it into the ocean. So, how does this become a radical Christian theology uh, or moment of preaching? Is that um, I, I talked about uh, how I think purity codes around money often work, specifically around objections to the Affordable Care Act um, with women's health. So, uh, talking very directly uh, about feminist concerns here about men controlling women's bodies and men being paternalistic over women's women's bodies um give it in this kind of farce that because because this catholic hospital's accounting department touched this money it's now holy right and um and if and if this and to make a couple steps forward in how i preach this you know if if this is if the church becomes what's holding the gospel back we need to be willing to uproot the whole thing and throw it into the sea right mm-hmm. and cr- the only if the, if what's going to continue the gospel of Jesus is to throw away the church, then that's what we got to do. And, you know, it, it sounds a little hypocritical coming from somebody that's inside of the church. But, uh, but then again, I'm also, I'm also the one who, uh, uh, will be out of a job when it happens. So the, the, um, I, I think it's about teaching an auto deconstructive ecclesiology, uh, to use Caputo's terminology. Uh, one that recognizes that this system and this structure is weak and the, and the cracks are in the system. We've already seen that the curtain has torn and there's nothing behind it. And we need to, if we're going to hold on to this structure that we call the church as a building and as an institution, we need to do it in a way that does lead us to live the death of God out in this community again, rather than just proclaiming this system of sacrifice for ourselves in closed doors. Mm-hmm. So, am, I, am I making some no, sense? No, that's great. That's great. I'm pretty sure that uh, ministers will now be borrowing the uh, Temple Mount reference and throwing it into the sea next time that text comes up in the uh, uh, the liturgical cycle. Um, but before we go, I, I want to ask you a question. Um, the uh, thinking about kind of your own faith journey, theological morphing, ending up in a weird place academically and in a church at the same time, thinking through the life of the church and the place for different people. What's that look like um, as a parent? Like how has 
your own kind of thought process and um and 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 stuff affected the way you parent do bible story time prayer mm-hmm. uh rites of passage that kind of stuff that's a great question and that is uh, and i'm sure you can uh, relate to as a parent that is uh preeminent on on my mind a lot um i'm very fortunate that my my wife is a uh stay-at-home mother uh she works in the home um we have a a daughter with adhd uh that is very challenging um but teach teaching children that the importance of church um and connecting it to ethics and justice right and my oldest son is eight and he's, he's at a point where he's making sense of this. And recently we started talking to him about, about uh, same sex marriage and where we stand on it and, and how this makes us different than others in our family. Um, knowing that at school, the other kids might find out that our church does gay weddings and that might be an issue. Um, and also knowing that most of the, most of our family members are not supportive. Um, and, and teaching why we believe in this and why, why this is so important to us and how this relates to the stories of Jesus, uh, of loving everyone. And, you know, it's, it's amazing that kids just get it, you know, uh, they don't have, they don't have to untangle all the baggage, uh, that they've been given. Um, one, one thing that I found really helpful in thinking about racism and, and parenting is, uh, Tandeika's book, uh, uh, learning to be white, mm-hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, um, which does this great analysis of how racism develops in white children. Um, and, and she does this ethnography at the beginning of the book of talking to white adults about the first time they realized that there was something different about people with different skin colors and, and understanding how that, how that moment becomes a crisis for the child. Um, and, and really being careful about picking that apart with our children. Um, you know, any pa- pastor has a work, work family ba- balance issue. Uh, all parent pastors, kids have PK issues. Um, I think our congregation is pretty good about, about not putting high expectations on our children, but, um, but I, I think it's important for us to, to pass along these values, um, and also give them the freedom to step away from them. If, if that's, uh, if that's so needed that, um, I'm not, I'm not so, um, so entrenched in my own ideology that if my children decide to, uh, go to a Methodist church, that that's going to, that's going to kill me. Um, I don't know if that's what you were. No, no, no. So which, which would be worse? They, they end up five point Calvinist or libertarians. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. That's a horror. You can think, but you know what? I was a member of the libertarian party for a short time. (laughs) I went to a state convention. Uh, I, I love the ideas of it. And I went to the Pennsylvania Libertarian Party convention when it was in Pittsburgh. And uh, then, I, then I realized that uh, uh, I didn't like Ayn Rand. Well, <laughs> it shouldn't take too long for Christians to connect those dots. But you'd you be know, surprised. You would be surprised. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining the podcast. I was really, really, really glad to finally get to uh, talk to you and uh, looking forward to uh, all sorts of excitement in the near future. And, um, yeah, so tell us any parting shots, what you're working on or something like that you feel like uh, sharing with everyone. Sure. I, I have a new book of sermons in the works that I hope will be out this fall that will follow lectionary, uh, lectionary year uh, C because that starts in the fall. Uh, that will be called The World is Crucifixion, and it will have uh, a foreword by Catherine Sarah Moody and an afterword by Carl Raschke. And uh, I have uh, another sermon book in the, in the mix uh, going on. I have a book on Girardian perspectives of Masonic ritual uh, that I am looking for a publisher at the moment. <laughs> now that uh, is a niche right there. A side project on violence in ritual, uh, specifically with, uh, Masonic ritual. Um, and that is a completed project. Uh, and, uh, uh, as I said before, um, I have a project on confirmation on the works, but, uh, this is the first time really saying it in public that, uh, me and a collaborator have a, 
a uh, large reference project in the works that will be the the introductory pr- uh, book to radical theology uh, when it comes out. And uh, it's a huge, huge pro- project uh, that does not have yet does not yet have a contract, but I believe will soon. And then I can talk about it more specifics. Uh, but for those that are really confused about radical theology and its connection between the death of God movement and the um, strands of radical feminism and deconstruction in the 1980s and the religious turn of continental philosophy. Uh, this is going to be the source that brings it all together and brings brings uh, thinkers as, uh, as different as uh, Mary Daly and Lloyd Gearing uh, into di- in, together into one place and recovering some forgotten figures like Leslie Duart um, and, uh, and William Hamilton uh, and Paul Van Buren and bringing them in the conversation with the current things going on right now. So I'm really excited about bringing that together uh, so that uh, when we talk about radical theology, we know what we're talking about uh, and it's and that it has a tradition that goes back further than the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tripp. <laughs>